so, so this is, is quite a common um, problem that we encounter in our patients with the low rectal cancers. So you, you see this is the baseline scan, the pretreatment scan, which shows a, a rather polypoidal lesion in the lower third of the rectum. The lowest point of the tumor you can see here. So um, as you've just heard from the anatomy, we can see some of the structures that we're concerned about in, in rectal cancer surgery. So this is the levator muscle. And as it reaches the rectal wall posteriorly, it turns into the puborectalis muscle, and then it becomes the external sphincter. And you, what, you, what you can see is that the tumor is anterolateral. We'll, I'll show you some more images which will give you a better idea. But essentially, it's a bulky tumor, and the lower edge of this tumor is arising at approximately three centimeters from the anal verge. So we see this. Okay. So that's the measurements that we took. So we always measure from the lowest point of the internal sphincter, which you see here, and that clinically correlates with the intersphincteric groove, clinically, because we, we're, we're not really sure about the dentate line. Anal verge can be anywhere. So if you take the internal sphincter and measure that to the top of the puborectalis sling, that gives you the height of the anal canal, and then from the top of the puborectalis sling to the lower edge of the tumor, that gives you the distance to the external sphincter, the to, to the top of the sphincter complex. So it, it tells you here that there's eight millimeters between the lowest edge of the tumor and the sphincter complex. So if you were to do an anorectal anastomosis, it would be right down onto the level of the sphincter, which you know, is, is maybe a challenge. Now we have a look at the axial images, and this is well above the tumor. This is at the level of the pelvic brim, and as we, as we go through it, you see the normal anatomy on the high-resolution scan of the rectal wall. The mucosa is black. The submucosa is in higher signal intensity. Then you see the muscularis propria. Then you see the mesorectum. This sort of thing, which is a lymph node abutting, the mesorectal margin, we ignore because it's uniform, signal, smooth bordered. Doesn't matter about the size. That does not relate to the risk of malignancy. So we would classify this as benign. So there's no features here to suggest a malignant node. These are the vessels, but as you can see, they're not expanded by tumor signal. They're looking normal. So that's what a normal vessel will look like. The perirectal veins. So that's normal, normal, normal. And then eventually we get to the level of the tumor, which we start to see. Now, as you can see, the rectum is not in the correct plane because the images have not been done axial to the rectal wall. So you see this strange shape of the rectum. But even, even so, you can see that the rectal muscularis is completely intact. And these nodes we ignore. It's smooth bordered and uh, there's no evidence of any tumor involvement of them. So the problem is, is if you start calling all these lymph nodes positive, and every patient will have positive lymph nodes, particularly on high resolution MRI where you see a lot of nodes. So it, it, this is just a benign looking node and is part of the normal host immune response. Then you've got the circular muscle coat here, the longitudinal muscle coat here, and the tumor is confined to the inner fibers of the muscularis propria. The normal mucosal layer pattern is visible here. This is one everted edge of the tumor. This is the central portion of the tumor, and this is the other everted edge. So the invasive portion of the tumor is on the right lateral quadrant at the nine o'clock position, and the distance of the tumor into the rectal wall is only a millimeter or two, and the distance from the rectal wall to the mesorectal margin where the invasive border of the tumor lies is, is more than five millimeters. Here, the tumor is very superficial, and so we're not concerned about any problem with the anterior mesorectal plane, nor with the posterior mesorectal plane. And, and as you can see, there's a full thickness of muscularis propria. So it's not a, a, re a, rectal, a low rectal cancer which is producing a radial margin at risk, because in order to produce a positive margin, the surgeon would have to cut through 
the entire thickness of the muscularis propria and perforate the anterior rectal wall in order to produce a positive margin, which hopefully would not happen. So what we see here is, is a well-defined tumour well within the rectum. And as we continue down, we're almost through the tumour. By the time we get to the puborectalis sling, there is no tumour left. So inside the sphincter complex, there is no tumour. So this is the lower fibres of the puborectalis sling, uh, or oh, sorry, the beginning of the puborectalis sling, and there isn't, the tumour has gone. This is just normal anatomy now. Normal anatomy all the way down to the anal verge. So the anal canal has not got any tumour within it. So on the baseline assessment, we have a low rectal cancer, semi-annular morphology, invasive borders the right lateral quadrant, T2, more than a millimetre to the TME and intersphincteric plane, no EMVI, TME plane is CRM is clear, no malignant nodes, no EMVI. So in our MDT, we may well be considering primary surgery, um, and maybe Paris can comment on whether he would prefer to do an ultra-low coloanal anastomosis, intersphincteric plane, APE, and, and all of this depends on the patient's own wishes and on the patient's sphincter function. And these are the considerations to think about. So anyway, the patient um, has had chemoradiotherapy, and what you see, instead of the original tumour, you see a crescent of fibrosis here. And the question is, what is this material here behind it? So we, we can have a look at this on the high resolution scans in a moment. But, but the, on the sagittal examination, the main thing that you see is the density of the fibrosis. And there is no clean fat between the fibrosis that we see and the prostatic capsule. It's, it's very, very fibrotic there. And that fibrosis begins, really, just if you look at how it starts, it starts really at the level of the mid portion to lowest portion of the seminal vesicles. They're the seminal vesicles, that's the prostate. So if you're doing a TME dissection and you're coming along here, this will be quite densely fibrotic anteriorly. But the tumour was not in the, involving the anterior quadrant. It was not invading the anterior quadrant originally. This is just the effects of radiotherapy. And then we, see, we have a look at the oblique axial images as we come through the tumour. And, and now what you see is the fibrosis of the tumour at the level of the seminal vesicle. So, so there is dense fibrosis here. But here and here, the, the, the submucosa looks normal. So we have very, very dense fibrosis. And here you can see the restoration of the bowel wall layers. We've got fibrosis, myenteric plexus, fibrosis, submucosa. So there's no disruption, particularly, of the submucosa at the level where we previously had seen tumour. We remember you saw a big, bulky tumour involving the lumen, and now we're seeing a normal fold pattern of the submucosa. So on, on clinical examination, I would imagine that you will feel a very fibrotic area of scarring, which goes from about the seven o'clock position to the 12 o'clock position. And it may feel like tumor, but the reality is this is just essentially dense fibrotic stroma. There could be some tumor cells within the fibrosis, but what, what we have discovered by following these patients up is that we don't know how viable those tumor cells are when you see them like that within the fibrosis. So this we would give a, a T, TRG grade of two, dense fibrosis only, and I cannot identify an area of residual intermediate signal intensity that signifies tumor itself. So that's why we call it TRG2. But we would give it a T stage because the fibrosis may contain some tumor cells, of uncertain viability. We don't know, yesterday you could biopsy it and it was positive, next week you could biopsy it and it may no longer be viable, it may be dead, it may be gone. In three months time it may be gone completely. So, so these are the sort of patients we put in our deferral of surgery program and we would, in the trigger trial, we randomize these patients to having, rather than primary surgery or, or 
surgery after, after the chemo radiotherapy, we would simply monitor this scar for evidence of viable tumour. And that means not just tumour evident on the biopsy at, say, 10 weeks, 14 weeks, 16 weeks, tumour actually growing back in the scar. So that's what we're looking for. So, so the way I would stage this is this is a low rectal cancer, which has now become pr predominantly fibrotic, MRTRG2, semi-annular scar, scarring on the right lateral and anterior quadrant, post-treatment fibrosis, with, vi with, with no obvious viable tumour, but if cancer is detected within the fibrosis, the most it would be is YMRT2, with more than a millimetre clear to the TME and intersphincteric plane, no EMVI. The TME plane is now very fibrosed, but there are no malignant nodes and no EMVI. So the question here to Paris is, what does he think about the plane between the fibrosis of the anterior rectal wall and the prostate? And, and would it necess be necessary now to do an extra levator approach in order to get adequate access to the anterior dissection plane? So that will be his, the main concern. And, and where the dissection will stop in the abdominal part of the operation, should it, should it stop at the level of the seminal vesicle because it's there where the fibrosis becomes particularly dense. Is it easier to do the dissection from below or from above? So the, these are the questions that we would be discussing in RMDT with Professor Tekis. I think he should comment now. <laughs> Professor Tekis, please. Thanks, Gina. Uh, obviously, there's a couple of things uh, the decision, what Can we, we do, keep the images, please? Uh, depends on really the bottom end of the tumor and what the sphincter is like and what are the patient's expectations. Because we are eight millimeters above the norectal junction, to join this patient up uh, and do a coloenal pull through, it needs to be young, it needs to be slim, uh, it needs to have a good sphincter. Uh, we get, this is a um, level three intersphincteric pull through which means you'll get a one centimeter clearance above the dentate line to do a hand-sewn anastomosis. So that's something we need to be thinking of. Uh, the, an APR would, of course, clear it, and it depends on what the patient expects and what's, what it means to have a stoma or no stoma. And it needs a discussion, obviously, pre-op, to decide whether this is suitable for uh, a pull-through. The next thing is, how far do we go down? I don't expect any problems posteriorly. There won't be any problems on the side. You don't really have to go too wide and crazy in terms of the dissection because it's not involving the elevators. Our biggest problem is anterior. If we can, now the question is, what's the danger of damaging the urethra? You are more likely to damage the urethra going from bottom up than uh, coming from top down. So if they were to do some dissection of the denonvillers fascia taking, going anterior to the denonvillers, <coughs> and go as far as they can, that's fine, and the rest will do it with prone. I wouldn't do this surgery by having the patient's legs up, because I need maximum exposure of the anterior wall, and you get this by having the patient in the prone position. Looking at the coccyx, if we remove it, we'd be able to get to the top of the seminal vesicle, so whatever <coughs> they do, we'll get to it. So it's not a difficult case. So that's my thinking before starting the case. So it's gonna be anterior the problem. <coughs> Is that, um, that's my thing. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, I would like to make another suggestion. What do you think, dear experts, in this situation, uh, taking into account the good response to radiotherapy and actually there is no signs of a viable tumor, is it possible in this situation to offer our patient, uh, uh, so to say, wait and see approach? I mean, uh, uh, um, give uh, several more causes of chemotherapy and follow up patient because the surgery, plant surgery, is really a traumatic one. Of course, we would not change anything right now, but theoretically thinking, in this case, can we offer to such a patient wait and see approach? Gina, what do you think? 
um, we, have, we are doing a trial to address this. Uh, I think if this patient was in the control arm, we would be obliged to operate just as you are obliged to operate today. But in, if they were randomized to the trigger arm, then this patient will be offered, and they don't have to accept this offer, they will be offered the opportunity to monitor the scar using MRI every three months and clinical assessment, and only if there is a change in the scar and the clinical assessment, i.e. there's evidence that the tumor is coming back, would we actually offer the patient surgery, which would be the same as they would have originally, i.e. Uh, probably now looking at this, an extra levator APE, because it looks as though sphincter cons conservation would be a challenge in, in this patient. So, so for this reason, we would offer a deferral approach. Спасибо большое. Будут ли какие-то комментарии из зала по поводу этого? Thanks a lot. Are there any more comments from the audience about this patient? If no, then thank you. Thanks a lot for this wonderful comment. Thank you.